Good morning and welcome back to First Thought Focus. First Thought Focus is our virtual conference series that aims to showcase the breadth and depth of First Thought's experts and clients, while also covering a wide range of topics that are relevant and important to the life sciences space. You can find replays of our past events and conference recaps, including a fantastic panel discussion we hosted yesterday on next generation sequencing platforms on our website, firstthought.io slash focus. Today, we are thrilled to welcome back position scientist and corporate strategist, Dr. Frank David. Earlier this year, we invited Frank on to the First Thought Focus to discuss his new book, The Pharmagellon Guide to Analyzing Biotech Clinical Trials. Today, we will be diving into another topic where Frank has published, biotech company valuations and forecasting. Before we get started, we will be taking questions throughout today's discussion from our listeners. If you are listening live and would like to submit a question, you can do so via email to events at firstthought.io. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our moderator, Neil Canavan. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as the case may be. My name is Neil Canavan. I am the general manager of the KOL Network here at LifeSci Advisors and the moderator for today's discussion, which I'm going to call, How Much is the Doggy in the Window? Or, You Paid How Much? <laughs> Discussing that dog and the prices one might be expecting be expected to pay for it as distinguished author and biotech consultant Frank David. As mentioned, author of the Pharmagellan Guide to Biotech Forecasting and Evaluation, as seen in my background here. This was published in 2016. Of the review of the uh, the reviewer in the New York Times, he said, I laughed, I cried, I even understood some of it. So Frank is going to explain the parts perhaps I didn't get on the first reading. Now um, so last bit of that understanding, uh, for the audience for which the book was written, I would like to start off today with Mr. David grounding us and who the book is for and a bit about what's in it before we begin our discussion today. So uh, Frank, take it away. Excellent. Um, hi everyone, thanks for, thanks for joining. I wanna just spend a few minutes um, level setting because I suspect we have a pretty broad range of people attending today. Uh, ranging from people who have built a lot of models, maybe are professional investors or professionals in business development, all the way to what I would call NPV curious, maybe people who are uh, in other functions, have see heard people talk about valuation and forecasting, but maybe have never built a model themselves. Um, <clears throat> so two quick points to make. First of all, we're going to cover a broad landscape of of potential use cases of forecasting and valuation here. But I think it's important to know that the details of how you do this differ depending on, for example, if you're trying to figure out whether to make an investment in a public company where there already is a financial value associated with it versus let's say you are part of an internal R&D team going to management and arguing for funding for your phase two program. Um, in some cases, you're going to be very focused on what the actual numbers are at the end, the NPV or the IRR. And in other cases, you might be more interested in articulating the investment thesis, the key risks, et cetera. And there are many other of those types of situations. We're not going to go into all of them in depth, but just bear in mind as we spend the next hour together, um, we're going to try to talk about this in a way where it's applicable to a variety of different situations. I think the other point that's just important to make right now, right off the bat is when I think about biotech forecasting evaluation, and certainly when I wrote the book, uh, the intention is really to be talking about uh, R&D stage drugs and R&D stage companies. As you get further along to the market, the issues change and also the amount of data that you have changes. When a drug has already been launched, you already know something about how its launch trajectory is going. You've probably done a lot more market research. There's a lot more known about what the competitive landscape is today. Whereas when you're back in phase one, you're in what I would call a data-free zone. And I think we're gonna spend most of the time today talking about the issues and challenges of being in that data-free zone of early R&D. So let's just go to the next slide quickly. Um, 
there are a lot of different ways to think about value. Uh, they're all valid and important and used in various settings. We're really only going to talk about one of them today, which is discounted cash flow, which I'll explain in a little bit, um, where you basically take asset by asset and you uh, plot out what you think is going to happen to that asset, both during the R&D period and then once it's on the market. Um, that's in contrast to these other uh, methods here. Again, all of those are used, especially in, uh, in banking and finance and investing. We're just not gonna talk about them today. So again, I just have a few quick slides coming up. The next three slides, I'm just gonna quickly get people who have not really done this before just oriented so we can have a conversation. So really this whole process has three parts to it. First of all, in biotech, we're gonna be thinking about how to make a patient-driven forecast. Uh, this is really the currency of the realm in biotech. And this is just one example from a project I did a while ago uh, in head and neck cancer, where you start with a number of patients and you try to figure out based on the epidemiology, based on where you think the drug is going to work, you try to figure out what is the total addressable market for that particular drug of interest. Um, and then from that, you would impose a price on that and a duration of treatment, et cetera. And then you would get some sort of gross sales number from, uh, from the patient-driven forecast. And then on the next slide, the, uh, the top line, uh, the sales are only one part of the equation. And if you've seen either a annual report or a quarterly report from a public company, or you've seen an analyst report from, uh, from an equity research group, uh, you've seen something that looks sort of like this, where at the top we have the sales, then we have the cost of sales, and we have a gross profit line, and then we have all of the other expenses, the commercial expenses, the R&D expenses, uh, et cetera, and then we end up with some sort of net income, and, uh, and then you're going to impose a, uh, a weighted cost of capital, which essentially refers to the time value of money. So a big principle here, and we'll talk about this more a little later, is that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future. So there has to be some accounting for the fact that, uh, that revenues today are more valuable than revenues 10 years from now. So that's step two, is to really get to that NPV number, which again, if you whether obviously all of the investors in the audience know what this is, but even if you're an R&D person who's been in governance meetings where you've had to Ask for uh, ask for resources. You've probably seen that your commercial colleagues have presented some sort of NPV of your of your program. And then the third piece, which is on the next slide, is really thinking about risk adjustment. So um, so that NPV that I showed you assumed that everything was going to work perfectly. Um, but then there are different ways to think about risk adjustment. And obviously, we're in biotech. So every trial has some risk of failure associated with it. Um, and then there's a risk at, at the regulatory stage as well. And, uh, and we can assign probabilities to those. And we can also think about different scenarios. In this case, these are scenarios, th this, this is just an example of different scenarios depending on whether we calculate the value today versus let's say we had gone all the way to the end of phase one and then how much does the value change? Um, and then what if we went all the way to the end of phase two B, how does the value change? But you can also imagine scenarios that have to do with what happens to competitors, macro issues, et cetera. So again, that's a very, hopefully that will get all of the newbies in the audience up to a point where we can have, have a useful conversation. And just as a setup for the, the rest of this, I just have one more slide. Um, just for those of you who maybe are somewhat more generalist focused, especially on the investing side, um, I think it's just worth thinking about why this process, which is somewhat similar to what you would do if you were investing in natural gas or telecom or an internet company or whatever, uh, why is this so hard in biotech? And I think there are really three, three key issues 
Uh, one of them is that, again, when we're talking about these early stage biotechs, it's a super long time horizon. It's going to take many years before any revenues get generated. And there are a lot of different scenarios along the way, both the success and failure of own program, but also, as I was saying, what happens with the commercial, with the competitive landscape, what happens in the macro environment, pricing, et cetera. Number two is that uh, there are many big drivers of these models that are highly uncertain. Price is kind of the most obvious one, but, uh, but even when we think about virtually any other line of that model, we think about the commercialization costs, we think about the actual population, uh, we think about uh, how much it's going to, um, how, how much it's going to cost us to run the actual infrastructure of the company. All of those are very uncertain and, uh, and can have huge effects on the final valuation. And then the final piece is, and I think this is no news to anyone here who's done biotech, but again, for the generalists who might be joining, um, R&D risk is a huge issue in this field and quantifying R&D risk is probably one of the biggest problems with doing biotech forecasting evaluation. And it's also one of the areas in which uh, small changes can have massive effects. So I think that's, again, probably enough to get us level set. And uh, I'm looking forward to fielding whatever questions Neil wants to, Neil and anyone attending want to throw at me. Okay, to that point, I do have questions of my own. Obviously, I'm the moderator, but the presentation is not for me. It's for you, the audience. Do not wait for me to announce it's time for Q&A. That time is right now. Feel free to dial in at any time. I'll hold your questions in the conversation as soon as I can. Uh, to the point of last events and this event, some of you may have dialed into the last conversation with Mr. Frank regarding the most recent work, Analyzing Biotech Clinical Trials, that was published this year. Do you have questions in that regard after we cover the important questions around evaluations, uh, questions from that last event and then topic are inbound? Related to both, uh, there are replays, there will be a replay for today, there is a replay for last time, and both will have a transcript available, uh, the last transcript is already available. If you want either of those, just reach out to Morgan or myself. Now I'm gonna start with a very broad question again to just sort of lay the groundwork for our conversations. Uh, current events, valuations across the board have come down. What the hell happened? Or I'll rephrase this question. How come I did not retire a year ago, Frank? Yes, so many, so many problems with, uh, and I apologize on behalf of the entire biotech stack. stack <laughs> entire. Um, you should. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, one of the challenges here, particularly for public companies is um, in these early stage pre-commercial uh, setting, in the early stage pre-commercial setting, there's always somewhat of a disconnect between what the market thinks and what you can credibly get to when you build a model. Um, and uh, part of that issue has to do with things like views of intrinsic risk, uh, R&D risk, and some of it has to do with the macro environment as well. Um, so I think what we're seeing right now is probably a situation where there were a lot of very, very early companies that uh, probably were somewhat richly valued by the public markets. Um, and those valuations are coming down into a range that's much more credible in terms of actually thinking about what's the real opportunity and what are the risks associated with um, realizing that opportunity. Um, and we're all, and, and I think that that's probably a big piece of it. There's another piece of this, which is I think the overall macro environment. Obviously some drug pricing legislation was just passed. And although the revenues for these companies are very far in the future, and I don't think anyone would realistically start to um, adjust their views of pricing for drugs that aren't gonna be launched for 10 years, based on what went on in Washington over the last month or two. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it does create an overhang over the entire sector, which then percolates downward. I guess one other point to make there is just, just related to the first point that I made about the disconnect between what's in the portfolio and, what's, and what the market says. 
you know, the market very often, I think, is valuing early stage biotechs based on what they think the value would be if they got acquired uh, by a larger company. So to a certain extent, that's one thing that ties those two pieces together is if you think that Pfizer and Merck and Roche are not going to be doing as well because of changes in pricing, for example, or inflation or what have you, then that probably will also affect what you think about their appetite for oversized M&A. And then that will trickle down into what you think the values of some of these early stage biotechs are. All right. Um, I just want to start with one more a slightly general question to dive into the topics. This is ranking. What's the first thing you consider when you consider like the de novo evaluation, new company, a new deck? Uh, and if the answer there is not the same as the most important thing to consider, what would that be? So let's say the three top things you look at, brand new company, you've never seen it before. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I again, I tend to build DCF models based on that are grounded in specific assets. So I think for companies that are super, that are so early that you can't even envision what their products are going to be, that these platform companies um, that are that are in the pre-product uh, candidate phase, uh, pre-development candidate phase, you know, that's a whole different question. Once you get to a point where you actually have a, a pipeline graph on your website or in your S1 um, that says, here are the things that we think we are developing and here's the path. I think I just take the path that I illustrated in those slides, which is I really just try to map out what do I think is the um, what do I think is the total size of that opportunity, assuming things go well, and then I try to figure out um, what do I think the odds are that things will go well. So um, you know, the first part of that is somewhat generic. Um, you know, any if I have two, if I'm looking at two different biotechs that are both that both have a lead candidate in lung cancer, those may look more similar than different, depending on what type, what part of lung cancer they're going into, et cetera. But then the details of exactly what that patient population looks like, exactly what the time and cost and probability of success are of R&D, um, those are obviously gonna be very different depending on the technologies and the patient populations, et cetera. Okay, you, you touched on one of the magic words, which is patients, patient populations. And now I'm going to proceed with questions as they're presented in the book. The first section is called income. This has to do with patients. The main issue there, as I see it, is, okay, how many of the new green pills can you actually sell? Uh, Frank, I, I can't tell you how many decks I've seen that claim they're going to sell that green pill to every last possible patient on earth for a bazillion dollars in the first year. Uh, so to the point of addressable patient populations, let's, let's start with how to count them. You've got incidence yeah. versus prevalence. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, the, so there may be a few things I would say there. First of all, um, you, one has to kind of agree on an epidemiologic way to think about what's the quote unquote total addressable market. And again, this is kind of model at forecasting 101, regardless of whether we're forecasting a, a web-based company or whether we're forecasting a biotech, um, is figuring out what, how are patients taking the drug. If we're using some, doing something that is based on chronic care, maybe we're looking at a prevalent population. If we're looking at treatment of hospital-associated pneumonia, we're probably looking at an incident population, et cetera. Um, obviously, one of the main issues here, um, and this is particularly relevant, I think, in rare disease, is the quality of data can really um, vary pretty dramatically, uh, depending you, on- you, you warn in your book, like, beware of the data source. Right. I mean, I, I would say that um, I've been surprised recently. I've done a few projects more in the rare disease space. I did some work in, um, in pediatric seizures earlier this year. And, um, and there's just a lot of uncertainty around how many patients there are um, with, these various, with these various syndromes. Part of the problem in that case, which, um, which happens a lot in rare diseases, non-genetic rare diseases, is that the definitions sometimes change. So actually the professional bodies 
um, in uh, in the seizure community, in the epilepsy community, redefined many of these syndromes earlier this year. So that kind of makes it hard to look at the published epidemiology literature and necessarily match it up with how patients are being diagnosed today. So I think that that ends up just being an issue where it's really hard to avoid um, getting deeply in the weeds of how patients are counted. Do, um, do you consider within that conversation, you mentioned PEDS, a lot of drugs are used off-label in pediatrics. Um, you know, gabapentin for one was approved, I don't remember for epilepsy and that's you'd be used for pain. Can you even consider those sort of uses? Yeah, so as for those of you who are in drug development organizations, it probably is no surprise to you that it's viewed as a major no-no to include off-label usage as part of a, uh, as part of evaluation exercise. Um, you know, the reality of the situation is that once things are on the market, you start to see how much is on label versus off label. And that becomes um, a little bit more uh, appropriate. Uh, the obvious case there is, well, what to me is the obvious case is lidoderm back in the day, uh, which is basically a lidocaine pain patch. The label was for post-herpetic neuralgia but 90% of the scripts were just being written for low back pain. Um, that being said, I think when you're building a model for an early stage company, the, the traditional approach and the, the, the appropriately conservative approach would be to really look at what the on-label value is in almost all circumstances. How about in my hypothetical deck, there's a whole page dedicated to physician education. Like we're gonna treat, figure out how to diagnose these patients plus Great question. I, mean, I think that um, there are a couple of ways in which that plays into modeling. Um, one has to do with uh, launch curves. So obviously, we don't know much. And when I say me, we, I mean, I think the broader community in biopharma does not really know that much about how to make launches faster uh, than, the, than the median. Um, I think there are a lot of consultants out there who say they have the special sauce there, but, uh, but I just have not seen good data that really uh, nails down the relationship between launch curves and specific strategies. That having been said, depending on the situation, there's more or less education that's necessary to get the word out. And sometimes it's just about your drug, but other times it's about even the indication itself that maybe there's low awareness of the actual indication. Sometimes it's because there's a new diagnostic, for example, um, that's gonna be required. That's not really not part of standard of care yet because there hasn't been a reason to test for it. This was certainly the case when the first ALK inhibitor, Zalcori, got launched. Um, you know, before that drug got launched, there was no reason to do ALK testing on a lung right. test because you right. didn't have a drug. So part of it involved not only educating people that there was a new drug available, but educating them that in order to use the new drug, they were also going to have to, um, to do this diagnostic test. And I think in, from a forecasting evaluation point of view, the way this often plays out, I think, is in various kind of scenarios. You'll often see people um, present a base case, a bull case, and a bear case um, where different levers are moved up and down. So maybe there's one situation in which you assume you're going to spend some money now, um, but that's going to really prime the pump so that at launch, everyone will know about your drug mm -hmm. and about the indication. Right. And maybe there's a base case, which is just sort of standard operating procedure. And maybe there's a, you know, maybe there's a worst case where you actually do nothing and you try to understand, you try to put some hypotheses down um, and turn those into numbers. I will say just one other thing on that point, which yep. is, um, you know, one of the things I think is particularly challenging, but also really kind of interesting and gets at the nub of this, uh, of biotech forecasting evaluation is that, that the building a forecast and building evaluation model really involves articulating what that story is. You can't really build the model unless you say, what you think are the drivers? What do you think is actually going on in the market? Um, and every decision you make involves a, a sentence that you can write down, a declarative sentence about some aspect of the story. 
um, if your story is that this drug is so much better than everything else that it's going to capture 100% market share and drive all of the competitors into oblivion, that's fine. And you can do that. And then you would put that into your model. If you do not believe that, then you should not be putting 100% market share as your peak uh, as your peak <clears throat> market share. And then you have to explain, well, what number are you choosing for your peak market share and why? Is that based on the things already on the market? Is it based on one or more other competitors who are ahead of you? So I think at almost every line of the model and every decision point, there's a narrative that goes with this. Um, there's a great book uh, by Demodoran at NYU. I have it on my bookshelf somewhere. I just can never remember the title. It's called, um, it's basically, um, it's about markets and it's, it's, it's called something like narrative and markets or something like that. And he goes through a bunch of examples and basically works through exactly this type of thinking process about how you right, sort well, of marry the numbers and the story. All right, let's move on. Uh, I, I am going to move on to pricing in the next section, but I want to honor the people who have uh, dialed into chat, which is quite a few. Uh, and I'm going to start with these. Uh, first is, what discount rate and terminal growth rate decently encompasses a highly risky asset? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, I'll talk, I, I think I'll talk more about the, um, the discount rate, because honestly, that's the, uh, that's, that's the part that just has a nor creates an enormous amount of angina among people who, uh, who build these models. Um, I think the risk with the discount rate, the, there are a few things to say there. One is that, you know, as classically defined, the discount rate you would calculate based on the, um, on the stock price, et cetera, and the volatility of the stock price. Um, the problem with that is um, that it essentially double counts risk in some ways, right? Because if you have a company that has a higher cost of capital um, because it is early stage, um, and that is that, so now you're sort of punishing the valuation because it's early stage. And now you're punishing it again by saying that it's gonna have trials that have a chance of failing. And the question is really how to marry those two things together in a way that's, uh, that's appropriate. Um, so that's one thing. I think, you know, most people will say that um, it is appropriate to take a higher discount rate for, a, for an early stage biotech and then to further risk adjust. Um, but I think, you know, this is a constant discussion and problem in the, in the industry. I think there's a separate issue when you come to questions about either internal pipe valuing for internal pipelines or when you're valuing for like a BD discussion, for example, where there, the discount rate isn't so much a sort of financial discount rate, but it's really a hurdle rate. It's what's the discount rate that I would need to impose that, I, that I've decided is the right discount rate in my organization, where if I can get a positive NPV with that discount rate, then this project has value. And if it doesn't, then it does not have value. And there, that's a very internally driven decision. I mean, I've seen those, you know, six, eight, 10% discount rates, for example, in large companies. Um, you know, similarly, if you're a small company, the way you would do your valuation um, of the asset in your own hands, you would probably impose a higher discount rate, you know, 12, 15% maybe. But then if you were thinking about what is it worth to Pfizer or how is Pfizer going to value our asset, you would probably use Pfizer's discount rate if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to model that. So again, I know that that's an extremely superficial answer to an extremely complicated question. Um, I think it's, I think it's, it's important to realize that there's not a single right answer to that and that there is a lot of debate um, among practitioners of what to do there. I, I think for the sake of time, since we only have an hour instead of five, uh, we're gonna have to go for the more quick and dirty responses uh, today. Uh, this one relates back to the uh, market penetration. What about the quote magic 3X peak sales multiple? Where does it come from? Magic 3x peak sales multiple. I am not sure I know what that is. Um, so if hmm. someone, if whoever posted that wants to, wants to give more, let's, let's table that for now. If someone wants to, okay. that wants to give more context, I'm happy to think about it. Um, All right. Then we'll ask them to, to, to uh, dial in with some clarity on that one. 
Um, so let's go to the next one. Uh, this is an interesting one. Again, I, I see this all the time. A magic word used in DEX is a platform. And I've seen this used in cases where there's only one drug, which fascinates me. How do you value a plat evaluate a platform versus a single asset in a medical device or a diagnostic? Yeah, super great question. Um, I think these DCF models really don't do well for platform for early stage platform companies. Um, you know, they're really best suited for um, uh, for asset driven uh, companies where you know what some of the assets are. That having been said, I mean, I have been in some situations where it's a little bit of a hybrid where the company is, this is especially true recently where I'm seeing a lot of, uh, I, I've been asked to do diligence recently on a lot of these AI for drug discovery types of companies where they supposedly have a platform, but at the same time, they also have a pipeline of what, you know, where there are one or two things either in the clinic or near the clinic. Um, I think my approach tends to be there to value the assets if there are assets identified and then uh, give some thought to uh, usually using other methods like comparables, what else I would really, what other value I would ascribe to the platform separate from the identified assets. But I think the advantage of doing it the way I just described is at least then you've described what you think the floor is, which is even if the platform doesn't really doesn't really deliver much else of value, at least you know, at least you have a point of view on the intrinsic value of the assets that they're pushing through the pipeline. All right, next question. This goes back to market penetration. Uh, the question reads, how can anyone gain any confidence over the penetration line in models for crowded areas like Duchesne? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, there's a whole, I, I mean, I would say the short, the, the short and trite answer there is high quality market research. Um, you know, this is something that um, that is worth doing and learning how to do well. Um, it's very difficult to do it for early stage companies, but um, but I think for the, in those sorts of situations, the kinds of questions you ask physicians are really aimed at understanding uh, whether the new, whether the hypothetical new product is position to actually meaningfully steal share from the incumbents because it does something just completely different from um, from what the incumbent from what the incumbent drugs do. I think the other thing that you would again thinking about Duchenne's um, as just one example, I think also primary research, if I were doing research in that area, I'd be in, very interested in the stickiness question, which is, you know, if you have a patient who's now on a drug, and they feel like they are doing well, and maybe they demonstrably by objective criteria are doing well, um, they may be very unlikely to switch to something new, uh, even if there are data that say that that new thing is better, unless there's a discrete problem. Like, yes, I like the efficacy of this drug, but it has terrible side effects. And now you're telling me there's this new thing where I can avoid those side effects. Mm. You know, that's a situation in which people switch. But I do think that there's a fair amount of magical thinking that happens sometimes about how willing uh, patients and physicians are to switch from something that is already working. And again, I would say, just think about it even in your own life, you know, the number of purchases that you make that are fairly sticky, um, you know, who's your insurance provider, you know, who's your home insurance provider, for example. Well, well let's go to the example where there's only one insurance provider or in my area cable provider. All right, we'll yeah. start there. But, okay, so first to market. Our company's gonna be first to market. How, how big a push is that on your model? Yeah, so I think there's, um, we talk about in the book, there are some pretty good rule of thumb numbers to use for order of entry. And I tend to use those as kind of a base case. So the second entrant splits the market 60, 40, 40 60, you know, 40% for the second entrant. Um, there's something called a zip zip distribution, ZIPF, um, that one can uh, that one can use. And I use that sort of as a starting point, and then I tend to correct for some of these other factors, like what we were just talking about. So that would be the sort of base case statin number two kind of question, mm -hmm. right? Where the drugs are roughly equivalent, and you just are going to get your fair share of the market. And then, um, and then you would correct that upward or, or maybe even downward, depending on whether you think your drug has 
is better or worse in ways that matter to physicians and patients. Okay, I want to follow up on the word first. And this goes into the pre-call we have. We were talking about pricing. And I said, and we, we talked extensively. And I said, well, how much of that should we just throw out when it comes to gene therapy? And you're like, all of it. <laughs> so, so, all right. So here's the question as it reads in chat. How do you adapt forecasting models for, quote, first takes all, end quote, curative gene therapies in rare disease? Any tips on how to best incorporate competitive dynamics here? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I have been asked this before and I've been, I, I don't, I don't have a single glib answer for you. I would say a few things. You know, number one um, is I don't think we have enough information yet to really understand how fast or slow those uptake curves are going to be of novel gene therapy products. Um, you know, historically there was an idea in the literature um, that probably is to a certain extent true. It's just hard to prove that sort of pioneer products you know, really novel products just take longer to be adopted because just it's human behavior. Um, uh, that the second that things in established classes, it's a lot, the, the adoption tends to be a lot faster. So, you know, I think there is one question there about sort of how much of that first of the population is going to get eaten by the first entrant in something like gene therapy mm -hmm. is going to depend a lot on sort of what those time differentials look like between launch number one, launch number two, et cetera. Um, the second issue there is incident versus prevalence. So obviously there's a continued incident population, which is small, um, but that is kind of open hunting season. And I think the discussion, that when I've done this, I've tried to sort of map out sort of, there's a prevalent population, which we think is gonna to get totally, is going to get um, systematically eroded away. And then there's an incident population which continues to uh, kind of recycle. Um, that becomes a little bit scary if you're the second or third gene therapy, I'm not gonna lie, because those incident populations usually can't make the math work uh, in terms of the overall value of the program. The value of the program is usually built on an assumption that you're gonna capture a large, if not entirety, a large percentage, if not an entirety of the prevalent population. Um, and if that's not true, I think that that's, again, getting back to the thing about the narratives and the, and the models, um, I think you really have to think carefully about how you would articulate to someone why you think your second or third or fourth to market gene therapy um, is going to capture any of the current prevalent market. Um, all right, I need to move on because we have a lot of questions and time is already running short. So let's 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 be as pithy as we can. Question: Where do you get net pricings for modeling? I use Medicare databases. Are there other sources? Good question. Um, I think that I've used a combination of uh, Medicare sources and also use some sort of standard uh, list to net kind of discount uh, numbers that are in the literature. We have some of that data in the book. Um, so there are some sort of rule of thumb numbers. Uh, this falls into that category of, of problems, especially for early stage biotechs, where um, you want to have something that's plausible, but I think you also want to accept the fact that there's a huge amount of uncertainty around the pricing. Um, this one has to do with, we, we sort of covered this. How would you value a novel therapeutic and development that has no approved similar, similar therapies on the market? especially when we're talking about cell therapy? Well, I guess what I would say is that everything, everything falls into some sort of clinical context, right? So, you know, it's, so it's often helpful to just start with how are patients being treated today, identified, diagnosed, and treated today, um, and really just kind of imagine a patient's flow and you may not think that those drugs or solutions are particularly interesting. There may also, depending on the therapeutic area, include non-pharmacologic interventions, whether they're, uh, whether they're uh, devices or whether they're surgical or what have you. Um, so I think there's always a context that you have to, a clinical context where you have to put your new therapy into. And then I think you have to figure out at what point in that flow chart you think you're going to be used and what you think the competitors are. Uh, those competitors don't magically go away, even if they're bad. They don't, ma they don't magically go away 
just on, on day one when you launch your new drug. Um, so, you know, I think that there are very rare, obviously there are some cases where there's absolutely nothing um, that can be done. But even there, again, I'll go back to epilepsy, where even though there is a lot of intractable epilepsy, pediatric epilepsy, um, a lot of those patients will go to surgery if they're amenable to it, or they'll go to, or they'll get some sort of uh, intracranial device, for example. So there are other treatment modalities out there, even though for many of these patients, there are not good drugs. So I guess I would start there. Okay, I would point out there's a lot of questions in chat. And so there's a great interest here. If you want another session with Frank, we can discuss both books. Please request that to Morgan. If we get enough requests, we will obviously schedule another hour, which I think is probably warranted here. Next question. We usually derive the probabilities of success on each phase based on historical data from past trials. You've touched on this. However, if the data from our clinical trial imply the asset is, quote, very successful, should we readjust upward the probability? And if so, how would you calculate this new probability? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the dirty secret of, or <laughs> non, the dirty non-secret of biotech forecasting and valuation, which is there's really no right answer to this. Um, you know, as the questioner pointed out, you can use historical numbers, although depending on how you cut those historical numbers, you can get to different answers with different levels of, of confidence. So just an example, if you have some drug in um, pancreatic cancer, for example, that's going into phase three, um, do you look at all of cancer? Do you look at pancreatic cancer drugs where pretty much everything has failed? And if everything has failed, do you assign a zero probability of success or a 5% you know, probability of success in pancreatic cancer? <clears throat> That's, that's, not unre that's, that's not unreasonable to at least think through some of those questions about really how to put that probability of success in context. I did write a blog post that's up on the Farmagellon website, more qualitatively dealing with these questions of where does risk come from in clinical trials. And you know, I think there are four components. There's the underlying science of both the disease and the, and the therapeutic. How well do you really understand this? How predictive are the models? Um, number two is the data that you have already in hand, so especially clinical data. Um, number three is the design of the trial that's being, that's being mounted. How likely do you, is it to uh, succeed or not? And the fourth is really kind of operational risk issues, which is, do you think that the, the organization that's actually running this trial uh, has the capacity to actually deliver, uh, uh, you know, deliver it. Um, actually, actually, just a, a brief uh, follow up of that. How, and I see this in the deck all the time, and, and the question always comes up to me: Can you physically do this? Is that real high in ranking of, of when you evaluate something? Can you do this? Meaning, can you can you can you pull off this trial? Can you pull in these patients? Yeah, can you get that I, institution? I think it's a great question. And I do think that in some of the, you know, especially in rare disease, this comes up a lot where I just saw this report this morning on Twitter um, about the amount of competition in Duchenne's, for example, um, in terms of development stage programs, you got to ask yourself how many patients are really available for program number 15 or program number 20 mm -hmm. in Duchenne's to run a phase three study. And how are they really going to get patients on board? I think it's a, that, that's a great question. Some of it is intrinsic to the disease. Some of it may have to do with the expertise and capabilities of the, of the sponsor. Um, mm. I mean, people don't like to say this out loud, but honestly, on first principles, if you tell me that you have a lung cancer trial, if you have the same asset for lung cancer, and in one case, you imagine it being in Pfizer's hands, and in the other case, you imagine it being in uh, the hands of a small biotech that has not launched a drug yet and an inexperienced management team, um, I would say that all other things being equal, the probability of success is higher in Pfizer's hands, even if everything else is constant. All right, I want to go to this question I, I like a lot because it refers to our sector at large and again, why I'm still working and not retired. How do you think about stock market price changes that fluctuate much more than the fundamentals of biotech companies? Do you ignore them as noise or do you assume that they represent actual intelligence about a company's value? Uh, I ignore them as noise. <laughs> I, 
I mean, it's just it's just a true fact that there's just a lot more uh, a lot more flux around uh, around early stage um, around these early stage market based valuations. Uh, you know, we had a paper several years ago where we actually looked at what happened to the stock price after a company announced um, uh, breakthrough designation, and. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there are a lot of people who trade stocks who think, ooh, that means, you know, I should, I should invest into that. That's a catalyst. And the answer was that you got a small bump after for a day or two, and then it basically went down to nothing once you corrected for the underlying market, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of magical thinking around, um, around some of these things that, are, that people think of as catalysts or think of as value drivers that probably aren't. All right, this one uh, goes to current market situations. Uh, how do you think about a smaller company's valuation when they're running low on cash, but they have a pivotal catalyst coming up? Do you view that as neutral or generally negative? Does it mostly enhance the downside risk of the event or a neg of a negative catalyst? I'm not sure that I necessarily, for me, I think the only way that that would impact the valuation is if I thought bad decisions were being made because the company was cash constrained. So for example, I'd be looking at, if I knew the company was, was cash constrained, I'd be looking at things like, do they run a trial that's a little bit too small and a little bit too aggressive on the, uh, on the effect size that they're trying to detect? Um, and that might make me reduce the probability of success. But assuming that they have the resources to run the trial, um, I think I would assign, at least from a trial POS, I think I would handle that the way I would handle it in any other case. Now, if you're asking what happens after that, you know, now you're asking a question of, is the company going to be able to raise enough money to you know, commercialize and hire a sales force, et cetera? Um, I, I agree. That's probably something that you'd, that you'd have to, again, going back to the narrative question, you'd have to have some point of view on that. Do you think that this positive data is going to be enough in the current climate um, to, to raise more capital or not? If you don't, then probably the, uh, the odds of success after the trial are low. This next one is also very much in the, in the vein of burn rate. Uh, how do you determine R&D costs pre and post launch? Clinical stage, you could tie a cost to the number of patients being treated in a trial, but is that accurate? And how do you determine preclinical costs? Post-launch, how long does R&D funding continue? Yeah, okay, so let me deal with the second first because I think it's a little bit easier. Um, you know, not counting going after new indications, which I think you would model as separate trials, et cetera. Um, there are some benchmarks. I don't know them off the top of my head, but I know we talk, I think we talk about them in the book. There are some benchmarks for sort of ongoing R&D expenses. Um, that's just sort of the care and feeding of, uh, of, an, of a marketed asset, whether it's, you know, maintaining the safety database or what have you. Um, if there's actual life cycle management, then I, then I try to model that out as, as de novo activities. And try to figure out what, to, okay, if the company is going to run a new phase three and a new indication, or they're going to run phase four studies, uh, what do I think those are going to look like? Um, in the pre-launch uh, time, it's a challenge. There are data on it. We, we went and summarized as best we could. Um, I think that whoever asked the question is correct, that there's kind of a tension between doing it on a per phase basis or a per patient basis. Um, and the answer is that the answer is yes and yes. So I think that uh, sort of figuring out, uh, having a good understanding of what per patient costs are. I tend to view a lot of these things as sort of per patient. In reality, there's probably a fixed cost and a variable cost in most of these situations. So especially in small, very small trials, if you think like a 20 patient, you know, rare disease trial, for example, um, that's a situation in which there's a fixed cost, which is probably pretty high. And then the very, so it's not all just taking the variable cost per patient and multiplying it by 20, because mm -hmm. the fixed cost just takes up much more of the expenses. Um, it's very difficult to get at. We have done some work there, um, uh, but it's, it's, it gets very complicated at, the, at that extreme low end margin, you know, especially in rare diseases. 
All right, this next question is very short, uh, so I'm guessing the answer will be very long. What is your what is your view on accuracy versus conservative margin of safety when modeling? I think that just gets back to that one of those first slides that I showed about what's the point of the model. Um, I think that if if I'm using the model really to to establish differences between different scenarios, then I'm not as concerned with the absolute number that comes out. I'm more concerned with the relative numbers that come out under different scenarios. Um, so there, I'm not as concerned of, about the accuracy problem. Um, if I'm actually trying to kind of make a public market valuation square with uh, with what I can represent in Excel, I think it's much more problematic. Um, and in fact, you know, my personal experience has been that when times are good, if we rewind the clock a little bit um, in biotech, when times are good and companies are flush and valuations are high, um, whenever I read analyst models of biotechs, um, I feel like they have to do a lot of mental gymnastics to um, to get their model to line up with what the market says the um, the company is actually worth um, to the point where sometimes the probability of success numbers are just frankly absurd or there's other there are other absurd aspects of the model. Um, I'm not sure that's a particularly helpful answer, but I think it I think the bottom line is it really depends on the setting in which you're doing the model doing the modeling. All right, now we have the clarification of the 3x uh, question that occurred okay. earlier. So, okay, thanks for uh, ask, taking the question. Well, all right, now, here we go. I've been interviewed at several biotech funds, and if they do not use a DCF, they use a discounted peak sales method. In general, they use 3x peak sales, and this is a hedge fund generally, but sometimes up to 6x for innovative assets. And interestingly, this, these are mutual funds and not hedge funds. Okay, I mean, Again, I have a particular point of view of that. And without casting, this is not my area. I'm not an investor. I'm not a hedge fund guy. So I don't mean to cast aspersions on anybody, but that's, to me, that's just not a helpful way of thinking about the sector because at the end of the day, um, in most of these cases, these are investments which are built on individual assets and employing these sort of course, that course metrics is sort of the equivalent of what people do in other sectors, just looking at sort of enterprise value to EBITDA ratios, for example. Sure, they're interesting at like a high level, at a macro level. Um, sometimes you can learn some things and get and figure out whether something is really in line or totally out of whack. Um, but on but once you zoom in on an individual company, I find them pretty unhelpful. All right, this one I like because I did some of this work when I was a journalist. Uh, I was assigned the task of asking physicians, would they use Exubera? And the best answer I got is no one asked us if we wanted this product. Uh, so with respect to market research to understand patient flow through lines of therapy, uh, for example, non-small cell, to use in your forecasting models, what are the pros and cons of doing physician interviews for a point in time estimate versus looking at a patient's record over time? That's a great, I think they, they can sort of complement each other and you can answer different questions, right? So I think you can often, and I don't, I'm not very experienced in using, um, in using, um, you know, uh, claims data or other types of, uh, you know, chart data, et cetera, to, to turn into the, uh, to figure out the epi and the splits between different uh, treatment lines, et cetera. But clearly there's a whole, realm of, of work that gets done in that area. I think the physician piece is to me about really the qualitative, it's, it's the qualitative and the semi-quantitative inputs, right? So I think on the qualitative side, I think the physician interviews for me really help me figure out what matters for a new drug. What are the actual factors that matter? And sometimes those are surprising. Um, either they're surprising qualitatively by what those factors are and which ones maybe you thought were important versus what, you know, getting back to your Exubra example versus ones that maybe were, are not actual big needs. Um, and sometimes they're quantitatively interesting in terms of how much of an improvement, I was just answering an email from someone earlier today, you know, how much of an improvement in pancreatic cancer overall survival would be perceived as meaningful? Is two months, you know, improved OS? Would that drive a lot of people to use some new drug? 
I don't know, but if I were thinking about investing in a company where that was the likely outcome, I think I'd want to do some market research on that question. So I think they're complementary to each other. You know, one of them is really the sort of qualitative and semi-quant uh, piece, and the other is really trying to nail down sort of the state of, and, and also the future looking piece. And on the, and on the claims um, and, and record side, it's more about getting good quantitation of what the situation is today. Uh, overall, uh, do you consider adoption early on? I'll give you a quick example. When Zalota came out, I was talking to some oncologists who were slightly upset. He goes, you know, listen, I just built an infusion suite. Uh, I got to pay for this thing. So do you take that sort of nature of adoption? Like, do the physicians want to use it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point. And certainly, I remember 10, 15 years ago, um, that was a big issue, especially, um, you know, sub areas like neurology, for example, where there were more infused drugs coming, and there was an idea that neurologists were really investing in infusion suites. In oncology, I remember there was a shift where people had built infusion suites, but then they had started investing in dispensing pharmacies, especially in large practices. Um, so, I think, I think my short answer is um, in extreme cases, I definitely think about those things. So, um, you know, med tech is an area in particular where um, let's just be honest, the practitioner, interventional cardiologists are just much more bottom line driven than other right. types of physicians. They understand their practice economics much better than the average private practice um, uh, internal medicine subspecialist. And they are very clear on what types of things they do that make money, what types of things don't make money, what's the margin if I use device A versus device B, or if I use, what's the margin, how does it change if I can finish my case 15 minutes faster with product A than product B, et cetera. So I would say I think about those issues much more in the med tech space and probably a little bit less in the, uh, in the drug space, except in sort of extreme circumstances. All right, we got three minutes. I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple more. The first question I can squeeze in easily. It says, can Frank and Neil come back for another hour, please? The answer is yes. What I suggest sure. to all listeners on this feed is uh, dial in your questions now. We will archive them, and then we can just start off with that with the next event. Great. Uh, so here's the next question, which I do not understand. So I'm just going to read it. <clears throat> the little r capital NPV applies to the compound probability to future project future project cash flows, but no drug is ever 10% approved. What about using a Monte Carlo simulation instead? Uh, absolutely, people do that. I would say that um, if you haven't, I've never seen uh, a good analysis of the pros and cons of doing, I think I talked about that on one of the early slides. I've never seen a good analysis of the pros and cons of doing kind of a Monte Carlo based analysis versus other approaches. Um, but certainly that's possible. I tend to do it a little bit more, just sort of having a bunch of scenarios and then just taking a weighted average of the scenarios just because it's very fast and easy. And I think for my purposes often gets me to a good enough number. But again, I think, you know, just being clear, I'm not an investor. I don't run a hedge fund. I think if I did, I would probably be investing in it, exploring mm -hmm. some of the other methods. All right, I'm going to ask one of my own for, I'm just going to assume there are companies on the call. You're worried about your evaluation. Uh, I don't know what to do. Give us a simple list of one or two things I could do right now uh, that would increase my valuation as in your mind. Well, I think one is um, avoid own goals. Right. So I think getting back to the question about probability of success, um, a lot of the problems, a, a lot of problems arise, especially with small companies, when um, there's a drive to get into phase three with kind of unconvincing data or with a study design that's really not um, that's really not justified. I'm just writing a, a little email update now. Um, and uh, by the way, sign up for my email updates if you'd like. Um, you can find out, you can get information on the website. Um, I'm just writing something about post hoc subset analyses. And you know, you do see these situations where a, tri where a company has a failed phase two, but then they find some subset of patients where, they, where it looks like there's a glimmer of success. And instead of running a small pilot study in that subset, they go straight into a big registrational phase three program um, to, uh, you know, specifically in that 
smaller subset. To me, that's an own goal in terms of valuation because you know it really just poisons the well in terms of what the perceived probability of success is. And as we've talked about, a lot of these probability of success estimates and the valuation inputs are very subjective. So it's it's as much what you do is as how what you do is perceived by the people who are assigning value to you. So I would say that's probably number one is avoid own goals. Um, and then the second thing, which is a little bit more of a long-term strategy is really just build the case piece by piece based on data for each of the parts of the, of the valuation. So spend some time really, um, really being transparent about how you're thinking about the number of patients and what data and use good data sources and show your work. Um, you know, give some, give some thought to how you're thinking about uh, what the cost of R&D is going to be, et cetera. All of these different phases, parts of the valuation, I think the more transparent companies can be, the more credibility it builds. And I think then, you know, I think in our sector, people tend to respond well to openness and credibility. Excellent. Frank, thank you so much. We have a lot of questions. Like I said, I think we're probably going to have a, a stage two, part two. Uh, in closing, Frank, uh, again, thank you. And how? Wh what's your blog handle? How do we get that? Uh, yeah, so pharmagellan.com. You can sign up to uh, get excerpts of the books. And you can also, if you sign up, you'll also get my twice a month newsletter, which is mostly focused right now on topics around clinical trials. Splendid. Morgan, take us out. Frank, thank you so much for joining us again and Neil for moderating. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.